My name is Mia and I work for CMI, in case you haven't been to one of these talks before. Um, CMI is a nonprofit organization whose main office is here in Revelstoke. And most of our time is spent facilitating professional development opportunities, such as courses and conferences. Uh, for people working in the various fields of ecology. But the CRED Talk series is um, a special project and it focuses on science communication sorry, um, to share the knowledge about the ecology of the Columbia Mountain region. And topics have varied and include themes such as land management, citizen science, research techniques. Uh, the series is supported by the Columbia Basin Trust, so we would like to give them a big thanks. Um, we'll be recording this, so you will be able to access it on our website uh, by next week. So in addition to the CRED Talk that you'll be hearing today, we have one more CRED Talk in this series, which will happen next week. And um, it will be given by Mikhail Pavlik, who is a PhD candidate at the Simon Fraser University, and is also a wildlife biologist with Cooper, Beauchene and Associates. And Mikael will be talking about annual and seasonal survival of yellow warbler with a focus on identifying stages of the annual cycle when mortality of these birds is highest. So again, this talk will be next week at 12 o'clock in this room. But now I would like to introduce you to Catherine Craig. And Catherine has been studying birds for over 14 years and is currently a wildlife biologist with Cooper, Beauchene and Associates here in Revelstoke. And she completed her Bachelor of Science at the University of Victoria and her Master's at Acadia University in Nova Scotia. And over the years, she has worked on many breeding and migratory bird research projects throughout North America, but is now enjoying being back in the mountains of BC. So welcome, Catherine. Thank everyone for coming. I'm going to be talking about a long-term monitoring program that's been taking place in Arrow Lakes and Cambasket Reservoirs for the last 10 years. I worked on this project first in its second year in 2009, and then I've been working on it um, every year for the last five years as well. And I just wanted to say off the top that much of what I'm presenting today owes a lot to work done by Harry Van Ort and Ryan Gale over the last 10 years, and they've been involved with this project for the full 10 years. So I'm going to start off with a description of the project and then provide an overview of what we know so far, and then um, talk briefly about research on Savannah Sparrow, which is kind of what I've mostly worked on in the field for the last uh, five years, I guess. So first, a little background on the project. This was initi initiated in 2008 to determine the impact that reservoir operations have on the productivity of birds breeding within the drawdown zones, and the drawdown zone being the area in each of the reservoirs in which the water fluctuates. So um, as many of you probably know here in Revelstoke, every year um, the river starts relatively low, and then the area kind of floods. Um, so we wanted to determine sort of how that affects birds breeding in those zones. And it was designed as a 10-year monitoring program because the reservoir elevations are not the same every year. And it's meant to look at sort of three things. Um, habitat use, so which habitats are the birds using to breed? And then how successful are they at breeding in these habitats? And how is that success impacted by the changes in reservoir elevation? And then the third thing is juvenile survival. So after birds leave their nests, um, are they impacted by reservoir operations at that point as well? So first, let's look at um, where we're talking about. And I'll just say that, um, so this started in 2008, and we kind of wrapped up the field work in 2017. Um, but we haven't done, you know, analyzed the full 10-year data set. So most of what I'm presenting today is just sort of what we know at this point. And, uh, what progress we've made towards answering those questions. So the th we have three study sites, um, two up in Kinbasket Reservoir and one down in Arrow Lakes. So this one you're probably familiar with, the one in Revelstoke. And it's sort of the area below the Revelstoke Dam down to Shelter Bay. And then the northern sites in Kinbasket, this one up here, Canoe Reach, is just south of Valemount, BC. And this one, Bush Arm, also in Kimbasket Reservoir, is just north of Golden. And we have two study sites up there because there's some different habitat types in that reservoir that we wanted to be able to sample. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. So just some pictures of the study sites to start off with. So this one you're probably familiar with. Uh, Revelstoke Beach has a variety of habitats. Um, this 
aerial shot shows kind of an overview of the reservoir. That's the airport one runway right there, airport marsh, um, this is Machete Island Cottonwood, and then the flats stretching down the 12 miles down there. So at lower elevations, uh, Revelstoke Beach has a lot of sand and unvegetated habitat, um, but also sort of these large fields of uh, reed canary grass, which are uh, present in quite a lot of area of the lower lying areas. And then this is a picture of Cartier Bay, which is slightly flooded in this photo. And then at higher elevations, there are more shrubs and trees. So there's uh, these sort of shrub savanna areas with shrubs scattered in grasslands and then uh, cottonwood stands shown here, unflooded and then in a flooded situation below. And then there's a couple of uh, particularly interesting habitats in Revelstoke Reach. One is Airport Marsh, which is uh, a place where there's some of the only examples of cattail and uh, bulrush and water sedge habitat. So there's all these uh, kind of little ponds and things like that. And then there's also some kind of flooded uh, willow swampy areas as well. The second one is uh, in Montana Bay. And here there's this unique sort of floating bog habitat. And here it's shown in high water conditions where it's entirely surrounded by water. And this island actually goes up and down on top of the, the rising uh, reservoir. And um, when this is not flooded, a large, this area in between is just grass and there's kind of a pond around it. So moving on to uh, Canoe Reach up here in Bellmount. A lot of the habitat up in Kimbasket is not as vegetated as the habitat in Revelstoke Reach. So you can see this uh, sort of more low-lying grassland habitat. This um, area is actually kind of interesting. It's one of the areas where savanna sparrows nest. It's actually quite wet, um, but again, sort of like lower, uh, just, just small uh, grasses, sedges, and horsetails and stuff. And there's a fair amount of unvegetated habitat also uh, in Kimbasket. And you will see some more of that here in Bush Arm. Uh, this uh, sort of unvegetated with stumps exists in all the drawdown zones um, as well. Bush Arm has just a very little bit of uh, kind of willow wetland habitat. And a lot of what we were monitoring up there is um, this kind of grassland area. And compared to Canoe Reach, it's um, a lot drier than the habitat that's similar in Canoe Reach and Savannah Sparrow's nest in both of them. And this picture here is just, this is where the Bush River uh, comes in. So um, just a few comments on how we select the, the sites for the study. So in each of those study areas, we have some different sites that are selected annually. And that, over the 10 years, it has meant been um, designed to include all of the available habitat types at different elevations within the reservoir. So for example, um, this is an image of some of those sites. So this is from 2017, and we have sort of different sec selections of habitat. And these, these ones sort of changed every year. So we'd sample, say, a section of, of willow shrub or a section of reed canary grass in a different location at a different elevation in the reservoir each year. We also, though, did have some long-term monitoring sites. And in Revelstoke Reach, those were at those unique habitats I pointed out. So one of them in Airport Marsh, and another one on that that covers a lot of that um, floating bog in Montana Bay. And in addition to that, in um, all the city sites, there are some focal species sites. In Revelstoke Reach, those are primarily for yellow warblers. And that research is done mainly by Simon Fraser University. And uh, in Kim Basket, that was some of our Savannah Sparrow sites. So once we have all of our sites selected, we go out and look for all the nests in the habitat. So the sites are searched systematically, primarily using bird presence and behavior to locate nests. So if you see birds with food or carrying nesting material, you can then follow them and figure out, hopefully, where their nests are. And we attempted to find all of the nests within one of those um, plots that I showed on the previous map within um, that were within kind of where the reservoir would flood. For, for instance, on Machete, if we're in the cottonwoods, we wouldn't necessarily look for everything that's uh, really high up in the air that wouldn't be impacted by the reservoir. But otherwise, we were looking for all nests in each of the habitats. And then once we found nests, we monitored them every three to four days until we determined their outcome, so whether the nests fledged or failed. And some of the focal species, um, for example, in Revelstoke, the yellow warblers uh, were banded or tagged to assist with monitoring them. 
and just a couple photos of us out in the field. So we always, every year it starts out where you're walking around in kind of dry habitat and then later in the season you have to get the canoe out and try and peer into the nest from some awkward position floating next to it. So after 10 years, um, we've covered most of the habitat types in Arrow Lakes and Kimbasket Reservoirs. In Arrow Lakes, this has resulted in about 2,500 nests that we found and 700 nests in Kimbasket. Uh, the total number of nesting species we found in Arrow Lakes is 65 and Kimbaska is 30. And then some of the common species listed there, Arrow Lakes has a lot more diversity of habitats and thus more species than Kimbaska. In Kimbaska, we're primarily monitoring spotted sandpiper and savanna sparrow. And there's a few um, notable species that we've had nesting in Arrow Lakes. Um, early in the study, there's American Avocet that nested, and that was, I think was in 2009. And then in 2010 and 16, shorted owl has nested. Um, and then this year, um, yellow-breasted chat was not within our study plot, but we did capture a juvenile at the banding station, so we believe that they nested this year at Machete Island. So um, looking at, this is sort of the cumulative number of nesting species that we've had each year. So starting in 2008, um, this is the number of species we found nesting in that year. And then as we've progressed through the study, we've resulted in the 65 total. So this is sort of like adding each year how many new species were found. Um, we think there's probably some more that could be found in Arrow Lakes. Uh, there's probably some more less common species that may, maybe some ducks or something that we haven't captured yet. But in Kinbasket, there really probably isn't that much more. It's been pretty uh, stable for the last little while. But as you can see, like the majority of them were found um, pretty early on in the study. So where are the birds nesting? Um, in both of the reservoirs, they're mostly nesting in the higher elevations of the drawdown zone, so where there are more complex habitat types. In Arrow Lakes, um, that includes ground shrub and tree nests, but in Kimbasket, it's primarily ground nesting. As I mentioned, the two species that are most common there are both ground nesters. And then comparing between the reservoirs, um, Overall, birds are more successful nesting in Kinbasket Reservoir than they are in Arrow Lakes. And that is both related to um, more flooding in Arrow Lakes, and, but also a higher rate of predation on nests. Um, so why might that be? Well, let's have a look um, specifically at the operations of the reservoirs. So this shows the reservoir elevations um, over the 10 years of the study. And that's, so those are the colored lines. And then the box plot in the background is sort of the historical average. And you can see there's a fair amount of variation in um, basically when the reservoir reaches its peak elevation each year. And um, yeah, like when it, when it occurs and how high it occurs. So if we look at years like uh, 2015 and 2016, the reservoir, uh, the maximum elevation of the reservoir is relatively low compared to some of these other years, but it also reaches that maximum earlier and then declines. Um, and then in all the, a bunch of these other years, it sort of steadily is rising through here um, before reaching quite a high elevation. And um, the primary time when birds are nesting is in this sort of June and July period. So you can see that this increase to these high level is happening around the time when there actually would be birds nesting in the reservoir. However, if we look at Kimbasket, this is a similar graph for Kimbasket, that sort of prime time when birds are nesting here in July, the reservoir has not yet reached the maximum elevations of the reservoir, and that, that is one of the reasons why in Arrow Lakes birds are more impacted by reservoir flooding. You can also see that it's more, sort of more consistent here, too. There's less variability from year to year in the sort of uh, in when uh, and how high Kimbasket Reservoir is coming up. This shows um, the number of nests flooded each year of the study. And you can see this variation um, that I just discussed here. And for instance, um, you know, Kimbasket, it's sort of like relatively low levels, like never more than 10 nests are getting flooded. However, in some years when Arrow Lake came up really high, um, you get quite high numbers of bird flooded. Um, and then in other years when it was really low, uh, 2015, there was no nest, nest mortalities due to flooding. 
overall, we found flooding has impacted 37 species breeding in these reservoirs. And um, as I mentioned before, this includes short-eared owl, um, which was affected by nest flooding in both of the years that it tried to nest in the, in the reservoir. We found there's a high impact to ground uh, nesting and wetland nesting species, which makes sense because ground nesting species are typically at lower elevations in the reservoir. And um, wetland nesting species, a lot of them are nesting just above water, so when the reservoir comes up, there's, it's right there. Uh, so combining all this data, um, Harry created a nest model based on nest densities for each habitat type, and that's what I'll show next. So looking here, this is similar to what I kind of discussed on the other graphs, but um, using it used the nest densities from the data that we collected to predict how many active nests would exist at different reservoir elevations at different times of the year. Uh, so you can see from Arrow Lakes, sort of this is where we're going to have the most active nests and uh, the reservoir elevations for the six years of data that went into the study are on here. So in many years, uh, the reservoir is rising into the elevations where there's a lot of nesting birds, except for in this one year, 2009, where it was extremely low. And in Cambasket, uh, this is offset a little bit. So during the time period when there's a lot of nesting going on, the reservoir hasn't quite reached these kind of higher elevations here where it would impact a greater number of nesting birds. However, um, looking at the impacts of these reservoirs on breeding birds is not quite as simple as just counting up the numbers of nests that are affected because birds are affected differently depending on what type of habitat they're nesting in. And we'll move on to that next. This is a paper that Harry published in 2015 and he looked specifically at um, how the fluctuating water levels affect the nest survivorship in, re ship in reservoir shrubs. So looking at two shrub nesting species, yellow warbler and willow flycatcher, just in Arrow Lakes, these two species have differences in nest placement and also differences in the timing of their nesting. And it was found that due to this, flycatchers did experience more nest flooding. I'll just show you an example of them in the figure from his paper. Sorry, it's a little bit blurry, but uh, so yellow warbler, the open circles, they're nesting earlier, so closer to June, and at higher elevations than the darker circles, the willow flycatchers, which are nesting closer to July, later in the season, and also at lower elevations within the reservoir. And this exposes them to uh, more danger from nest flooding. However, the finding of the, the key finding of this paper was actually that flooding did not actually affect the overall nest survival for either of these species. And that might not seem to make a lot of sense at first, but what we think is happening is that the nests, when the water comes in and submerges some of the nests, the nests that are remaining above the water, actually their survival is enhanced because that flooding protects them from predation. And nest survival was highest on um, the floating bog in Montana Bay, which is a site that's surrounded by water and um, is not impacted by reservoir flooding. And that finding that nests over water may gain protect protection from predators is something that had been has been documented in nest predation studies also. Uh, so I'm just going to move on now to talk about juvenile survival of Savannah, so Savannah Sparrow. This has been studied in Arrow Lakes with Yellow Warbler and then in Bush Arm and Canoe Reach we've been looking at it with Savannah Sparrow. So Savannah Sparrow is a ground nesting grassland species. Um, this is one of their nests shown right here. The juvenile savannah sparrows, after they leave the nest though, they're still running on the ground for probably at least a week after fledging, so they're still at risk of being affected by reservoir flooding. To find these nests, it was similar uh, work to what I described for the methods for the other nest mortality part of the study. Um, but in addition, we were color banding the young and attaching a transmitter. I, you probably can't see it quite in this photo, but there is a little... Uh, antenna sticking out the back of this bird. So those birds, after we tagged them, um, we tagged them usually pretty close to fledging, fledging, and then put them back in the nest and then tracked them daily to see uh, if they were, how their survival was going. So over the last five years, we tagged 94 juveniles in Kimbasket. The distribution of these between those two study sites is shown here. 
In Canoe Reach, we did tag some both inside and outside of the drawdown zone, so um, we will be able to make a comparison between survivorship in those two locations. This is a couple of little juveniles out and about after they left the nest. So, but of the 78 tagged juvenile, or of the 94 tagged juveniles, only 78 of them actually fledged because um, some others were flooded or predated in the nest before they actually uh, left. So 44% of the juveniles that we monitored survived the, survived the monitoring period. And the main cause of mortality was predators. However, we did have three birds that drowned in the reservoir. Um, in addition, we did have another bird that drowned in a puddle in the kind of wet habitat in Canoe Reach, but it was not related to the reservoir. And then um, many of them did have unknown fates. So we did find that their uh, flooding does impact the survival of some juveniles, and we'll be doing more in-depth analysis of this uh, soon. Uh, snakes and a bunch of probably unknown stuff where we just find the remains of a bird and you can't necessarily tell, but you definitely know that some of them were in snakes because I was tracking and the transmitter was inside a snake. So in summary, uh, between the two reservoirs um, and in relation to nest flooding, there's a fair amount of annual variation, particularly in Arrow Lakes. And uh, as illustrated by the nest model and the other graphs, the timing is of when the reservoir comes up is pretty important every year for determining how many nests get flooded. More birds in Arrow Lakes are affected by flooding than in Kimbasket. Um, the impact to some of the shrub nesting species is offset by possible protection from predators once their nests are elevated above the water. And however, there's an overall negative impact for ground nesting species and wetland birds. And also, as I just mentioned, some effect on uh, post-fledging juvenile survival. So we have made some suggestions for ways that the, these effects could be mitigated. Um, one would be to do some habitat improvement in Upper Kimbasket, as this is a region which typically is not flooded during the bird breeding season. Uh, another suggestion would be to create habitat islands, perhaps something similar to the floating bog in Montana, or even just uh, some kind of mounds or something with habitat on it if they wanted to enhance habitat within the drawdown zone. And um, one major way you could prevent a quarter of the nest flooding that occurs would be to stabilize the water level in airport marsh um, because there is a high density of nesting birds in the marsh in years where, um, where especially, yeah, in certain years there's like larger numbers of birds nesting there. And uh, so if that water level was prevented from flooding those nests, that could prevent a lot of the nest flooding that is currently occurring. So upcoming, we're going to be analyzing the full 10-year data set, um, doing more work on the su juvenile survival, and doing further, further in-depth analysis on specific species that we have a lot of data for. Um, all of this information is in our annual and year five interim reports, which are on BC Hydro's website. And the paper that I mentioned, um, Harry's shrub nesting paper, was published in Condor in 2015, so you could also look that up. And lastly, I'd like to thank Harry Van Ort for all of the analysis that I pre presented today, uh, all the other CBA staff and seasonal field technicians and our collaborators at Simon Fraser University and the Okanagan Nation Alliance, and of course, BC Hydro for their support of this project.